there on camera. Today is February 1st, 2019. We're in Winder, Georgia at the home of the Skeltons. And Mr. Skelton has just told us about his war, World War II experience and his life. And now Willis Moore is going to tell us about his life before and after his military service and is going to tell us about his service in Vietnam. And we really appreciate you being here. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the Atlanta History Center. Uh, with me is Tony Hilliard, who's also a volunteer, and Sue Verhoff, who's the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. And we're honored to have members of Mr. Willis's family today. Um, Charles Skelton, Mr. Skelton's wife, Fran Skelton, and Marion Welling, who is our interviewee's sister. So True. that's True. makes this sort of special that we've got family members to present here today. And I'll give you one little uh, tip right off. I prefer to go by Newton, although you we know the military sticks us with our first name okay. for two reasons. Okay. So first, uh, it's in honor of my grandfather, Newton Skelton, okay. who was my hero, Dr. Skelton's father. Oh, okay. So I cherish that. Yeah, Newton. well, you should. Uh, and uh, in particular, since this is for posterity, I, I want to remember him. And, uh, well, that, that's good. That's, that's special for you to do that. It is. Mr. Moore, would you give us your full name? Willis Newton Moore. Okay. And where and when were you born? January 30th, 1946 in Macon, Georgia. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, my dad uh, and mother met at Mercer, uh, which has a long legacy of uh, our family, the Skeltons in, uh, in particular. And uh, they, uh, my dad was a minister. And uh, I think sometime before, prior to their complete matriculation from Mercer, they he went into the full-time ministry and they moved us to Atlanta. And... Uh, in Atlanta, he had a pastorate, and we were closer to mm -hmm. our skeleton grandparents. <clears throat> By that time, I had six siblings, okay. so <laughs> we were pretty well yeah. needing to work. Yeah. And, uh, so, Dad had a small church, and Mother was always very industrious and very talented, like Miriam, mm -hmm. our daughter, <clears throat> played piano, taught herself, and. Uh, and raised all of us, and we were very, uh, uh, we were very uh, poor by economic standards. Mm -hmm. But that was not something that we really knew yeah. until uh, you know. I have events in my life that remind me when my parents wanted me to have a football uniform so I could play local oh. sports, mm -hmm. and I think it cost nine dollars. I don't know why I keep remembering that, <laughs> but uh, they had to take it back. To Sears, mm -hmm. and we're a very spiritual family. And my dad knew a minister friend in town whose boys played for Georgia Tech. And so that little football uniform that I probably would have cracked in two went back to Sears, and this big old Georgia Tech outfit came to me. <laughs> so it was bigger than I was, but you couldn't stop me if I got a good head of head, head start on you. So. I remember tough times, but we we never had uh, we never had uh, down times. Right, <clears throat> they were good times. Where did you go to school? Well, I started out in the inner city in uh, Atlanta at James L. Key School. Then we moved out to Cab County, and I would have been going to uh, Cab High School, but <clears throat> as the Lord does in Baptist preachers' lives, you don't settle down too long anywhere. And uh, he used to say, when a truck goes by the house, the furniture starts trembling. <laughs> and uh, we moved to a little town called Resaca, Georgia, mm -hmm. where Dad used to brag about being the uh, pastor of the First Baptist Church, which was the only Baptist church. <laughs> so he had that claim to fame one time in his life. <laughs> and uh, those good people built a, a pastorum for us that was beyond our wildest dreams, I think. No more than two of us bedded together 
mm. for the first time, yeah. and everybody seemed to have a closet. <laughs> uh, so that didn't last long. Yeah. We were gone in nine months to Dalton, Georgia, mm -hmm. where Dad and Mother took on a fledgling ministry, and as the Baptists do a lot, measure things in uh, qu quantity, mm -hmm. you know. Built a big strap of new church, and Mother did all of the uh, design with the uh, audio, and was, you could hear a pin drop from the balcony in this big church. And she taught school and did everything else you could do, from taking in kids for uh, tutoring and teaching them piano. She taught school and was the pastor's wife, and, uh, and she was uh, stricken with cancer in 62, which was at that time a really, mm -hmm. really bad thing. So we lost her. Uh, I would have probably been about 16. This would have been November of 62. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, my dad <clears throat> uh, married uh, the next year, and that probably was a little quick for the Baptist folks, anyhow. And uh, but he, so we moved fairly soon to Western Carolina, uh, where uh, a new a family of parishioners embraced us and mm -hmm. and helped us heal from losing our mother and okay. and, and some of the other things. That's where I, uh, uh, first time in my life, I didn't have to work mm -hmm. because it was in the middle of the year, so yeah. I got to play ball. Sure. And that threw me to death. And I, I was able to get a baseball scholarship commitment from some of the old coaches that had my uncle Red and mm -hmm. it's Dr. Skelton, yeah. and my dad he actually coached my dad, but he was still there okay. and gave me a scholarship okay. and held it for me until I got the Marine Corps. So I played for the same coach my dad did, and wow. that Uncle Red and them ran around <laughs> the chemistry building. That's pretty special. That was special. It was very special. He, as a matter of fact, he he told me that you know if my dad hadn't been too busy down in the campgrounds handling snakes, that's what he called it. And preaching, he might have been a great baseball player. Huh. I don't know. Yeah. I heard great stories about my Uncle Jimmy, whom we've talked about, yeah. who went in the Army, who yeah. hit a ball 10 miles. Wow. Uh, but uh, he was just a... And also, I, 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 we were talking about Uncle Jimmy, and my Uncle Red, uh, Dr. Skelton, told me at one time a story I had forgotten. If you remember the real <laughs> stars at Georgia, I know you went to Georgia, yeah. There was Sap, and, and there mm -hmm. was, uh, uh, good Lord, you know, the, the other two, the Trippy, yeah. and other, yeah. okay. Well, the third back in that backfield would have been my Uncle Jimmy, his brother. Oh, okay. He would have been the third, Wally Butts. Wally Butts, yeah. So, huh. he didn't, but that, yeah. was, that was where he was going. He must have been good. He was good, and he was tough. So, he's the one who went in the Army, became the chaplain, okay. and, you know. So, uh, I, I, you know, I then uh, came, <clears throat> then I was off to Vietnam. Well, I was off to the Marine Corps. Well, let's talk about your entrance into the military. Um, mm -hmm. Number one, how did your parents feel about it, and did you get drafted, or did you join voluntarily? I joined. I was not blessed with that wonderful mind you heard from my uncle. <laughs> I was uh, I was a guy who who who, who needed a, a cow prod, and. <laughs> I blame it on working and playing ball, but really and truly, I wasn't that interested. Mm -hmm. And so I needed the Marine Corps. Okay. And you and I both know what happens yep. on day one. Yeah. We all do. And they get your attention in a hurry. Yeah. And uh, so that's why I joined, was to help the family uh, financially. It helped for me to be able to do something at home. And How'd your father feel about I know your mother had been deceased, but how, how did your father feel about it? I, I think he was pleased. I think he mm -hmm. was he was uh, very supportive, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and at the same time, he was uh, he was uh, trying to make ends meet for a big family, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so he he saw that part of it as well. Mm -hmm. The Vietnam War at, in '64 was not quite what you and I remember, yeah. so it wasn't that issue that was hovering over all of us. That right. came along a year or so later. Yeah. Okay. So they were pleased, and, we, and I went in out of Morganton, North Carolina. Okay. Uh, 
Tell us about your military experiences. I, I know you mm -hmm. had many and you mm -hmm. were right in the middle of mm -hmm. some hot combat in Vietnam. But let's talk mm -hmm. about uh, your early days in the military, your training, uh -huh. where you were. Uh -huh. Well, I went to Paris Island, of course. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I really uh, began to focus on the task at hand mm -hmm. there. And you may remember that he, there is an outstanding recruit in each platoon. Mm -hmm. And I, I won that award in my platoon at Paris Island, so I got the dress blues and the mm -hmm. outstanding mm -hmm. uh, recruit award. Ironically, that was in 1964. Ironically, my son came along in 2000 and won the same award. So I, I, oh. I, I think that's pretty unique. That is. Uh, for uh, Marine Group. Uh, once I got through basic, I was assigned to sea duty, which was kind of an honor. Uh, and that's where I encountered Captain Royal Keith Steele, who then became later on Major General Steele, who was one of the finest mentors mm. of my life. I had, you know, I had my uncles, I had my dad, and now I'm picking up one of the greatest yeah. uh, people and uh, Marines. Uh, for examples, and he promoted me to sergeant. I was uh, at times the brig warden on the USS America, a big carrier. At times I was the uh, the was the bodyguard for the captain or the executive officer mm -hmm. of the ship. And all the time that Steele could get us on shore and train us, he did. Okay. He, he got us out in the dismal swamp and almost killed us for a week, <laughs> and uh, taught us how to build fires on water. And taught us how to survive swamp life yeah. and uh, get out of that swamp alive. And so uh, he was good for my training on a ship. Yeah. And then I went to Pendleton. And uh, by the time I got to Pendleton, the rule was, uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, but you had to have 12 months in order to do Vietnam. If they wouldn't, I guess, spend mm -hmm. the money to get you, take you over there if you didn't have something. Yeah. The clock was ticking for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's now 63, and I get out in 60, I mean, it's now 67, and I get out in 68. Right. And so I was assigned to train the kids that okay. were coming through there to go yeah. to Vietnam. And it just wasn't going to work. Mm -hmm. And I walked in the captain's office one day, I'd been there maybe six months, and he took one look at me and he said, you want to go, don't you? And I said, no, I don't want to go but I can't do this. And he said, okay, go home for 30 days and I'll get you over there. That's how I got to feel. Okay. I got over there and uh, went into Da Nang. Uh, you never know what to expect, you know. I I just uh, prayed that, you know, I could get through this. And I got uh, uh, this uh, black sergeant major met the two Ninus uh, recruits at Da Nang. And once we, once he finally sat the few of us down, and there were a lot of us that were filling in for two nine, and I thought, well, they must be somewhere where it ain't good, mm -hmm. or they wouldn't need all of us, because mm -hmm. the other units weren't getting that many. And lo and behold, they were at in under siege, <clears throat> and this sergeant major basically said, "Where you're going, the whole earth trembles all day, every day." Yeah, yeah. you may want to. Clarify what two nine. Yeah, yeah. The Goff Company was the company I was assigned to, and the Second Battalion, Ninth Marines, and I believe Colonel S. First Marine Division. Uh, I know that at Conti End there was three nine of the Third Division and two nine uh, in a perimeter around that hill, which was not that big, and uh, we were right on the DMZ, and they were pounding us every day, and for anybody that thinks. Uh, walls if you want I don't want to get too political here but if you don't think they work uh, ask Lieutenant Colonel Tony there about all the Constantina wire we, we we loved for them to bring up there so we could string that stuff high as we could get it and uh, explain for somebody that's watching this and doesn't know what the DMZ was uh, it's the dividing uh, uh, I guess, uh, strip between mm -hmm. North and South okay. Vietnam. And uh, I know that uh, Dr. Skelton mentioned earlier about some of the rules, or we were talking about the rules. We we were not allowed to cross it. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, we had a colonel that if we were after him, 
we we chase them to the bend high okay. and then <laughs> hustle back and we did that a time or two okay. but that strip was supposedly there for us to uh, see better when mm -hmm. they cross well of course they were coming through cambodia yeah. laos you all know all that and uh, uh so that was a peak hill that they wanted very badly it was one where we really had control of what we could see from jillian uh over west toward cambodia laos uh, area but we were getting really destroyed up there i read in the magazine that came to me when I was in college and I I don't know where it came from but there were pictures in here and I'll probably ask uh, Sue to make copies at some point of what was going on on that hill and uh, that's pretty much uh, mm. every day with the monsoon uh, problems that we had to deal with and it was just run from one hole to the next if you could get there in time and would you give the name of the hill again how contien c-o-n-t-h-i-e-n -E and, and that's on the front of the on yeah. the cover of the magazine yes it is and it's right and there in the corner and that is represented to be me right here hmm. you know the photographer that took this was running and gunning so he wasn't stopping to interview mm -hmm. you Huh. But uh, I, I rem that was one of my sectors right there, okay. and we did that all the way around the okay. hill for, well, we were up there 41 days before we got out of there, and uh, we took 577, according to the article, wounded in 30 days, mm. and 73 killed. Mm. And I recall, I don't know if either one of you ever saw, that was a, another duty you had is to fish out your hole. So, so things wouldn't get, you know, yeah. you learn how to keep things dry, yeah. like your socks, mm -hmm. put them under your armpits, and your your um, uh, your your ammunition, put them mm -hmm. in sandwich bags, mm -hmm. if you can get a ziplock, yeah. you know. <clears throat> so, um, but we were restricted to go out, couldn't go out more than 500 yards from the wire, because they were they were always there. Mm -hmm. They wanted that hill. What was so demoralizing to me is we held the hill. We took it. And six months later, we came back to take mm -hmm. it again. Mm -hmm. And I never understood that about the Blue Room, wherever those folks were. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, we were really, the, the war was really stacking up back home in mm -hmm. terms of t statistics, yeah. I guess. So... Um, I, I had uh, mentioned to you earlier that I had been in Vietnam, I was still in the, at Don, uh, K, uh, Saigon, when out in the bush was a, a, a formation of a lot of Marines, and I didn't understand why all these Marines were out in the jungle and just standing there. And so I was out there because they trucked me over there, and uh, Colonel Peeler, who was my battalion commander of held in a helmet. That was the name of our battalion. We had a helmet with a piece of lightning going through it. Mm -hmm. And it, Colonel Peeler saw me and he came over and he said, uh, Sergeant, are you with Hell in a Helmet? And I said, yes, sir. I was just mesmerized by his mustache like my uncle was talking mm -hmm. about because he had a little peanut butter in the end of it. <laughs> and it was turned up, you know. And I said, yes, sir. I'm with 2-9. He said, how long have you been here? And I said, I just got here yesterday. And he said, you don't have a Purple Heart yet? <clears throat> and I said, no, sir. And he said, well, you stick with Colonel Peeler and I'll get you one. And that was a Purple Heart ceremony. <laughs> Gosh. I thought, oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the wrong place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the fact of the matter <laughs> is, I'd rather have been with him because he really, he really knew his stuff yeah. and he took it to him. And uh, then I had been... Uh, in, in many of the other places. So after Kantian, it was just up and down the DMZ. Now, Kantian, what, describe what your role was each day as a soldier. You know, it's hard to say that because when you're pinned down in mm -hmm. a place, it's not a whole lot of organization. Mm -hmm. Unlike uh, Dr. Skelton or Lieutenant Skelton, we didn't have two meetings a day. Cause meetings were, how you doing? Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> I got any ammo? <laughs> you know, we, the, you, as a matter of fact, the there was a little lieutenant that was in charge of my little 
sector wire there and he was an architect from New York and he was a little wiry guy named Floyd and he wore little little beady glasses well he had dug a hole so complex into the side of that hill that when they told me that he wanted to see me I thought I had to get a flashlight twice to get back in there to find him <laughs> then I get him back there and he's got all this stuff and all this maps and drawings and everything and uh, you know my assignment was to be a, at that time a squad leader and then I was a platoon leader and then I was a lieutenant in fact or not in fact, I was a lieutenant in the spot many times. Mm -hmm. So I rotated from one platoon to, to the other two platoons, depending on what was down. But up there, it was just everybody keep your hole defended and get us, get as many of them as we can mm -hmm. and get off this hill. Mm -hmm. and, and we did eventually, uh, got off of there and mm -hmm. moved on to uh, some worst place. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk, let's talk about those. <laughs> well, the trace, what we call the trace, uh, was probably the place, although I got lots of hot metal exploding around me and falling on me in places up on Contin, the trace was the place where God intervened. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're, we're a faith family and you probably know that, but, uh, mm -hmm. I said, uh, you know, the place I found the Lord more present than ever is in real combat where there are no distractions mm -hmm. and in the courtroom when it's right. Yeah, yeah. You know what That's I'm true. saying? Yeah. It, yeah. You, you, it's, it's you and it. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I got ahead. We're working with the Arvins. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry to, I'm sure it went one of your units, mm -hmm. but I, we're working with the Arvins and, and I see them sweeping on the right and I'm sweeping right beside them and the rest of my company is sweeping this way. And I got in the middle somehow, and I don't, I don't know how. But you know, the jungle's not an easy place to figure out where you are. Yeah. And the next thing I know, bullets are coming both ways at me mm. and my little group. Mm. So my little group became three of us because it was get down wherever you are. Mm -hmm. And my corpsman and my radioman and I were pinned between them and us, and we began to dig a hole with our hands, just. Mm whatever we could do to get yeah. below the to yeah. topographical crest. And uh, as I was about to move in, got to get low, I got a hole shot through my pocket. And that told me, right, what I needed to know. He knows me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he wants me. <laughs> and so I said, we got to get down here and just mm -hmm. hold on. And then one of my kids next to me, Ward, hollered over to me and said, uh, uh, I'm hit, Sergeant. I said, all right. Well, hold on, Ward. He said, I'm dying. I said, I said, no, I'll move over. I'll roll over. So I rolled over. Ward had what I thought was a flesh wound right in the side. And I told him, I said, you're not dying. We'll get back over here in a minute and drag you back. Because by this time, Captain Chapio, who remains one of my best friends today, he has a little bit of a problem, and I'd say this to his face, with explosives. Frank Chapio will blow up anything before he'll disarm <laughs> it for you engineers back there, Colonel. And sometimes he would blow up things that we needed, like let's blow up the bridge after we cross it, if you don't mind. But we called him Demo Dan. So he gets on the blower and he goes, where are you? And I start to shackle, like I'm still that, that Marine that does it by the book, right? I've got a shackle. And he says, quit shackling and tell me where you are. And I said, shoot, fire a shot in their direction. And it went right over my head. And I said, mm -hmm. I'm between you and them. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you got to get back here now. I said, where? To the hedgerow. And it's starting to get dark. Mm -hmm. So I pulled the uh, John Wayne of all John Waynes because I didn't know if Mr. Happy over here still, had me, mm -hmm. still wanted me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so I put my helmet on my on my flashing oh. and being he popped it and I said mm. this ain't good we yeah. <laughs> yeah so then I just went on full automatic over my head toward him hoping I'd get him down then I told Ch Lieutenant Chapio to put the 60s up there and if they don't mind push them up about 12 inches because we're you talking about 60 caliber machine yeah gun. just pull them up a little bit so we can get under them and just spray that whole line and I'll get warded 
we go over to get Ward and he's dead. Mm. That made it tough for three of us yeah. because he's yeah. a big boy. Yeah. But we got him back and we got to Frank, it got back to our, our crew and we just rattled back four or 500 yards for the night because we were, we were just all in disarray. And uh, so that's where we went after Conti Inn. We took a pretty good bit of casualties there, but they had a way of uh, when you were depleted, the you know the uh, folks that are had a way of giving you a little respite here. Mm -hmm. So they put us on the rock pile, which was right in the face of what we called Monkey Mountain, okay. which is where the guns set for the mm -hmm. for the other boys. And, but they just wanted to take a pot shot up now every every now and then at at, at rock at uh, the rock pile. Yeah. And so we got some more casualties up there, but not nearly like Conti and or the Trace. And uh, then we went back to Dong Ha for a, lick our wounds for a little bit. And uh, uh, you know they 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 had the basketball goal aimed in and the uh, what we called the. The crappers, mm -hmm. well, right. say it in a better way, yeah. and uh, so that made it tough if you wanted to relax. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't take the Wall Street Journal down there. <laughs> you need to take an entrenching tour <laughs> over the other way. And so they left us there for a, two or three weeks, and then and then hit us out on. Um, we we patrol the whole time, <clears throat> and one of the, you know, one of the. Uh, books that, well, it's a memoir. Uh, this was Lieutenant Fred Tomasello. Uh, Fred Tomasello was one of those lieutenants that came in uh, when I was being replaced. I was the lieutenant. Now I get another lieutenant. So here comes Tomasello, and I'm going to be his platoon sergeant. So he comes in, uh, and he tells us in the book, he, he says an awful lot of really nice things about me through here. It's not that not that you know I'm more to focus on that, but what I did want to focus on is how you can be so detached in this, this kind of environment <clears throat> that you forget that you've been hit. Mm. And when we came in off patrol one time, I looked at Lieutenant Tomasello and I said, "You know, you've been hit." His his ear was bleeding, and that's the hole in his helmet. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> and then he. He puts a picture of me and him here off of patrol, okay. Can you, did you get and he goes into, uh, he, he, he crawls into this hole with me when he first gets there. And uh, he was uh, shaking like a leaf, which, you know, happens. I mean, he, he, I, I love him, and he became a, a very fine, uh, very fine uh, officer. And, uh, but uh, he said we had drawn a very bad ambush that night, our platoon. And I'd been there for a long time, and he looked at me and he said, "You know, I want you to run this ambush tonight." And I said, "Don't worry, I was going to do that anyhow." <laughs> and that's how it goes, you yeah. know. I mean, I respect him, but would you hold that picture sure. up? We'd like to get sure. that, sure, on the, as much as we can on yeah. the. Oh. Good, good. Is that yeah. good? Okay. And so uh, he goes through the ambush in here, and. Sure enough, we, we, we were in the right place. Okay. Here comes ox carts. Mm -hmm. You know the drill. Yeah. And once I hear more than one ox cart, and we're just a small ambush, I think, we're going to need to hit and run. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. This ain't going to be They got more stuff than we got. Yeah. So he's... Describe for people yeah, watching sure. this what an ox cart is. Well, it's the way they transported their weapons, and it mm -hmm. looks like an old... Um, you know, a cart pulled by a water buffalo with mm -hmm. wooden wheels and uh, mm -hmm. made out of wood, but they, they would haul ammo and weapons and people and, yeah. you know, and if they had that kind of support coming down a trail, you knew they weren't bringing pea shooters. Mm -hmm. So I, he, uh, Chet, uh, Thomas Sello keeps going into how he, he says now, and I say, no, not now, hold. And then we, and I said, no, when we hit this thing, we're, we're out of here, mm -hmm. you know, because this is not going to be, we ain't going to stay here and wait on them to load up that stuff. <laughs> so he went back, just to, just as his story, he went back as an FO and, uh, and was, was wounded pretty badly. But I've seen him come to my house here in Gainesville, mm -hmm. and uh, 
you know, like all these books that these folks write, you know, there were people who weren't happy with some of this stuff. And, and I told him, I said, well, I can tell you right now, everything you wrote about me and there's over 40 pages is absolutely true. Because I know that for a fact. Well, and you said you didn't want to focus on the good things he said about you, but I think for purposes of what we're doing today, we, uh, tell us about generally well, what he t said he, about he, you. He was told by uh, one of the officers when he came in, uh, he, he was being acquainted with the platoon he was going to take over. And he was told by the other officers that you want Sergeant Moore to run the show. Okay. He's been here, he knows what he's doing, he's cool, he's, you know, squared away, that sort of thing. And uh, so he relied on me very heavily. That's why he said what he said mm -hmm. the first night. Yeah. I want you to run the ambush. Okay. And he depended on me very heavily, but it wasn't any time before he was like another Earth lieutenant. Mm. They rotated back, you right. know. Yeah. Us enlisted boys had to stay out there. Yeah. They got to go back. And I didn't begrudge that. Yeah. But Frank Chapio never rotated back. Yeah. He wouldn't let him. Okay. So he um, <clears throat> he was became one of my best friends, still is today. And we shared a best friend named Lieutenant Jim Parsons. And if nothing else, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is the, uh, the one thing that really will always be there for me because Jim Parsons uh, was a first lieutenant from Missouri. He was our FO. We had a little wooden tower uh, that he would go up in at night and he'd get shot at every night he went up in. Mm. So he was a great basketball player and at Missouri mm. and so we when we had time we would we knew they weren't shooting at the goal we would rally up down there and play basketball mm -hmm. in my captain was a teacher from New York, that captain. And I didn't think about it until later. But you know how you go last name, first name. Mm -hmm. Well, his last name was Barra, and his first name was Paul. So mm -hmm. I thought Paul Barra is a little bit little bit on the creepy side here for us boys that are gri zipping up green yes. bags every day. <laughs> but he was a quite, a, quite a character and a, quite a little basketball player. Mm -hmm. So he and Iron Parsons would play on occasion, and then I'd go up in the tower with Parsons at night just to keep him company. Mm -hmm. So he had a, a battalion-wide, if not division-wide, tech on radio. With, you know, as a forward observer, he could mm -hmm. contact anybody. So he had a great sense of humor, and we sat up there one night, knew we were going to get shot at, and just play it, just hoping it wouldn't be in the wrong place. and. The Stars and Stripes radio came on with I can see for miles and miles and miles, and he put it on the division tack. And we'd do it almost every week. <laughs> and then an order came out that says they're like, trying to find out who's doing that. <laughs> and it was Parsons and me. And so we just became so close. And uh, so he would, he would plot all of my patrols. If I was taking a bad patrol or a good patrol, it didn't matter, we, all of them were bad. He would get my map and we would go up to a place and he would go, okay, I'm gonna shoot, I'm gonna shoot these asthmas for you. I'm gonna show you where I'm gonna shoot it if you need it. And one night he saved me big time. He just surrounded me in an ambush. I had to stay all night and he just kept plowing it around. That'll take him out of there. And the next morning we had to step over him to get back. But I went in and just, so he and Chapio go on R and R in Denying. We probably can we as a statute run on this one, Carl, or, or it, 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 because when we got to Denying, sergeants going to the NCO route, they're going to the O route, and they said, "Oh no, you're going with us," and they put bars on me, <laughs> and I go to the O to his clubs and have to answer questions from generals and colonels about my officer candidacy class, which I would always have a drink and say, what well, <laughs> they would answer. Because <laughs> it was three days of the peas are taking me to jail. But those guys were just so close yeah. to me. Yeah. And uh, so it wasn't any time that this little battle happened. And uh, this is, this is, uh, on Bridge 28, we were trying to help open the road to Quezon, and we got pinned down in April of 19. 
There's what's left of us. Hmm. Uh, we get we get pinned. Can you down. hold that up? We want to be sure, sure. we get that on sure. the camera. That's the, and this is a very fine book uh, authored by one of my corpsmen. I mean, one of our radio men who is uh, hmm. New York Times. Hmm. So anyhow, in here uh, we. Uh, we were trying to open this bridge where the there was a six by on the bridge and it was full of dead Marines and the truck was running. Mm -hmm. And some of them were ours. We had left a little squad mm -hmm. out there for attachment. Mm -hmm. And so they called for us to come out there and do something about it. So we're up walking up the road and Parsons is our FO. They were on the high ground. We were out here on the, on, on the low ground. And every time I sent somebody around the corner, they had them right in the fart. I mean, they were just on us. So um, Parsons was going to get us some air support. And so he... stepped off right in front of me and put his helmet back and they hit him with a 50. Mm -hmm. uh, he never knew what hit him. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, something like that. You know, I've seen a lot of that right close to me and all, but it's just like that person is here and that person is not here. And for a year, I avoided his family and uh, because they would write me in college or they'd send it to my dad. And finally, my dad said, son, you, you have got to go up there and see these people. So I got a friend and uh, I went to Warsaw, Missouri, 17 hour drive. And uh, I didn't know what I was gonna say. Uh, and I didn't know if I was up for it. I'm still not sure. But his dad was a pharmacist. And when we walked in this little pharmacy in Warsaw, Missouri, I saw, you know how the old pharmacies are, like where the docks and winder got there. <laughs> They're up on the pedestal back there. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought I was looking at Jim Parsons. Mm -hmm. And this guy looked at me and said, you got to be Sergeant Moore. And he shut the pharmacy down and we went to the house. Mm -hmm. And when I got to their house, there was a stack of letters on their kitchen table. And they said, uh, would you uh, be kind enough to tell us what you can and go through some of these letters? And I said, well, you know, I, I mean, I don't, I may not know a lot of it. And they said, no, all those letters are about you. Really? And so three days later, I crawled out of that place. Wow. They had buried him up on the Osage River <clears throat> in a single grave, and there was nothing on it. And they said, we just can't come to grips with, with what to say or what to do. And I said, well, he had a saying on his helmet that uh, I remember. And I've been through now undergrad, law school, and a PhD, and I've never met anybody that knew the source of this saying. And it was happy as the man who enjoys the scenery on a detour. Mm. Wow. That's, that says it all. And he did. So. Well, I know it meant a lot to his family that you uh, went. Yeah. It was hard on you, but it meant a yeah. lot to them. And I just have not been able to do a whole lot since then that I'd like to do, you know. But uh, I thought that was... <clears throat> that was the legacy he left them mm -hmm. that uh, you know because you think about that I don't get frustrated on many detours yeah God sent yeah. him to me yeah, yeah. and uh, you know so that's that's driven me an awful lot mm -hmm. and then it then it comes to the probably the last kind of phase uh, of, my, of my of my combat career when uh, we get off that bridge and we've really taken a pound and uh, we, we don't, we probably were cut in half in what we had left and we were supposed to be licking our wounds, getting it back together up on a, a little hill I don't even remember between Bridge 28 and the rock pile and uh, our guys were so spent that uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, supply people were sending out a pellet of beer just to try and do what it does for people in combat. And here comes this Chinook chopper with this big pallet of beer on a cable 
right in front of our hill and the cable breaks and he drops it in a minefield, oh, a, a French minefield, you know, oh. like we ain't got no, we ain't got the colonel to tell us where to go from there. We ain't got a maps. I had kids trying to volunteer to, I said, whoa, whoa, no, no, you ain't doing that. I said, so I had to call the mortars up and blow that beer right there in front of me. Oh. It spewed everywhere, but it was nothing I could do. No. And so if you, at that particular place too, we ran into our biggest lizard of all, who <laughs> crawled in the hole with Louis Tataro, one of my best buddies. And you don't get a snake or a lizard around a New Yorker. And he stabbed it five million times <laughs> and shot it four times. <laughs> and we started to drag it out. And lo and behold, some mountain yards appeared. Mm -hmm. And Mike Chuhoy came over and said, they want the lizard. And I said, for what? And they said, he said, they want to cook it. And I said, well, you tell them to cook it down here. And if it's any good, give us some. It was doggone good. <laughs> and so we, we had that little experience up there. And then along comes my fifth or sixth, but my last captain, who's like a lot of them, looking for, you know, a fruit salad. Let's, let's mm -hmm. get these boys in some. Yeah, that's one of the things that really gets you if you're yeah. enlisted. You're mm -hmm. always there on every patrol, but you get an officer about every three, four, five months, and they got to build up their yeah. repertoire, you know. And yeah. so here comes Captain Butler, bless his old heart. And uh, I've already been replaced by a lieutenant from Alabama. And I've got about three weeks left in the Marine Corps, period. I'd already been called back, offered a battlefield commission. Said, nope, I'm not extended. I knew there was a hitch, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you know. Oh, yeah. I said, what's the hitch, Colonel? Well, we need you to extend for six months. Not six <laughs> minutes, not six. If I can get back to my unit now and weather these next three weeks, I'm going to college. <laughs> and uh, so I was able to uh, get through that and here comes the newest captain and he's got us in one over on the coast in the Hoi An, right on the coast. Well, we hadn't fought on, in the sand much, so, but I knew something was going on or we wouldn't be shipping us up there. So <coughs> my gunnery sergeant said to the captain, he said, well, you know, Sergeant Moore has been here the whole tour, he's never missed a mission and he's he's short. I don't know what they did with you guys, but when, when my guys got short, I put them in a hole mm -hmm. and they didn't go anywhere. That's just how it is. Just for clarification, yeah. short means you're about to head get back. Out of the, yeah. Get out of NOM, get out, of, and in my case, out of the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And so things get spooky, as you know, mm -hmm. toward that time. Mm -hmm. So the gunnery sergeant told him co-captain Buckner that and Captain Buckner said well if Sergeant Moore doesn't want to go he didn't have to right in front of my troops mm -hmm. that's not the way that's mm -hmm. not the way you do that the way you do that the way you two mm -hmm. would do it or I would do it stay right here you get mm -hmm. so I'm on a chopper in the next day and I have no command I, I have no nobody under me no, no, I'm just there I'm a rifleman mm -hmm. and when this chopper lands and it's hot uh, I mean, it's hot. They're pushing us out. They're not dropping down. Mm -hmm. It's like, go. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hear bullets flying everywhere. I feel like I'm lost. Now I don't know. I, I can't call a radio man. I can't do this. I, and it was really bizarre for mm -hmm. me in yeah. my mind. And these bullets are close. And so the next thing I know, an explosion happens. I'm convinced it was a recoilless rifle. And I am going sailing through the air. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where my rifle went, my helmet, nothing. And I'm in a hole with my favorite corpsman, Doc DeWeese, Gene DeWeese, who's in this book. And uh, Gene is uh, putting, it's over 100 degrees. And, and the choppers can't get in. We got too many wounded. And he's uh, putting this bomb crater water on me. I had abrasions from things, but, you know, they weren't, diagnosing concussions mm -hmm. back there mm -hmm. you know yeah. and the rules were you know different you take a you got to yeah. take a stitch and all that but I read in the book here where uh, uh, Lieutenant uh, uh, Hagen who's missing in action by the way from Savannah wrote to uh, he was there he pulled me back to the to the hole there and he said Sergeant Moore had gone home. He was pretty bad off, but he recovered in fine form. 
And then Lieutenant Chap uh, Lieutenant Hagen came to see me at Mercer, and he went back as an F.O., and he's now missing in action mm. from Savannah. So mm. I had to go mm. see his parents, uh, mm. you know. And that's how I wound up on the repos. And the only other experience that I came to my mind was I was on the tail end of a Chinook with a lot of wounded. And as it, the nose pulled up, I felt my legs all got hot. And I thought, oh, God, I'm paralyzed. And I looked down, and the blood was going over my ankles up. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the repos, was, they had their, that, those, those Navy docs had it together. I mean, they had me. And the next thing I know is I said to a nurse, um, they asked me uh, if there's anything I wanted. And I said, yeah, I'd really like to pee. And she said, well, you've been doing that for about 12 days. And I said, mm -hmm. good. How'd hmm. y'all do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, well, yeah. At any rate, so uh, I do want to clarify one sure. thing too. You mentioned the Martin Yards and the Lizard. Yeah. Th those are the in indigenous they are. native people in they, Vietnam. They are in. Uh, I'm sure you, hmm. you being intelligence, had some yeah. interaction with those folks. And what what really made me. Uh, was astonishing to me is everything in our area was if it wasn't us we shot it mm -hmm. and here these people come yeah. like they've been in a cave yeah uh, but boy they knew where they did food was they, did. they knew where other things mm -hmm. were you know the the uh the worst things that i saw done to people uh you know when and war is just hell mm -hmm. as they say that's mm -hmm. all it is you know <clears throat> but uh we kept getting a kid on the rock pile that would come to our wire with ice and Coca-Cola. And there's nobody else around, and there he is. And I, I had some boys that, you know, were, you know, they were weak enough to sense them, but they didn't see the, they didn't like the old Sarge because I always had my guard up. Mm -hmm. And I kept telling them, don't let that kid in the wire. Mm -hmm. Take the ice, take the Coke, go down the, and then uh, he did. He came in one day and dropped a grenade in a hole, and they threw him in there. I bet he wasn't 10 years old. So the way they use it, that's kind of an ISIS thing. Yeah. Still, isn't it? yeah. And, and what we don't understand, I think, that we, we miss in these uh, conflicts is these cultures have been around hundreds of years. Yeah. They're, they're, they don't want to be Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian. They... They want their culture. They honor what, how they live. You know, the yeah. fact that a water buffalo is a sacred animal to them doesn't make any sense to me. But I'm not going to shoot it yeah. because it it is to them. Yeah. That a pagoda, you don't walk across, you don't mm -hmm. damage a pagoda. You, you had to deal with all. And we just keep making the same mistakes over and over and over. We're gonna we're gonna convert these folks to democracy. Yeah. They don't want democracy. Yeah. You know, they they want what they have. They want their yeah. life. So I, I wish we had known a whole lot more about the North Vietnamese people before we mm. were over there just loading up. And yeah. that's something that I I miss greatly because I didn't understand when we would cross a rice paddy, when we would come up on a pagoda or a water buffalo, I did not understand the full mm -hmm. extent yeah. of what I should have yeah. in order to honor their traditions yeah uh you know so that's a sad way of looking back at it but you know the fact of the matter is as i was telling miriam coming over sometimes i think god gives you a re really ble a really unique blessing and to be able to be just in a place with him mm -hmm. where it's yeah. That whole shot in my pocket, that was just me and him. Amen. Yeah. That was me and him having it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm out of this thing. Yeah. And so I've cherished that a lot. And you should. Yes, I do. What was the morale like during the period you were talking about? Because you were working as a team, your life was on the line every minute. Uh, yeah. Our morale, the Marine morale was good. Mm -hmm. The morale vis-a-vis -vis the politics of what we were having to do was terrible. Mm -hmm. You know, that we're going to defeat communism and, and that we're going to go take this hill, then we're going to come back and take it again. 
uh, and putting all these kids in bags and uh, maiming these. I mean, there's not one in here that isn't maimed in some way or another. I was telling uh, Tony, I think a little while ago, I, I think three, three types of Marines came back from Vietnam. The ones that are on the wall, which didn't come back. Mm -hmm. The ones that came back but didn't, like Uncle Red was describing, mm -hmm. some of the war-torn mm -hmm. mental. And fortunately, some like me who back, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I will never forget. Yeah. But, you know, God has been, has blessed me with the ability to be home. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, uh, that war has been... Uh, a blessing to me and the people I met, associated with, and uh, created uh, created bonds that are stronger than. Oh, we have a almost, bond. The three of us yeah. have a bond, right? The four of us. That's right. And it's 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 that experience. It's war that you know. That's right. For whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, you know, and we're not in all this fussing and fighting over who's anointed mm -hmm. one. You know, yeah. uh, we're in something that says we have a bond. We might not agree on everything, mm -hmm. but we have a bond. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm 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 pleased to uh, I'm pleased to have had that. We all get together. I, I get yeah, together with yeah. the uh, America group and this group. So that I want to back up and ask you a question yeah. about your arrival in Vietnam. What was your first impression when you put your boots on the ground the first time in Vietnam? Mm -hmm. I thought I was on Mars. <laughs> I, I I was not. Huh. I, I I was so pensive about what to expect and where am I going mm -hmm. and uh, the war was so public uh, you know my whole family followed it on TV mm -hmm. I couldn't wait to say where I was going mm -hmm. and it not be one of the hot areas yeah. so yeah. Contien had not hit this place mm -hmm. when I went yeah. and yet it was going yeah. And so I wrote home and said, don't worry about me. I'm going to a little place called Conti Inn. <laughs> 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 what would I know? Yeah. That it was going to be all over the news. Yeah. So I just was uh, committed to, you know, doing my best and, um, and getting home. You know, saving as many of my kids as I could, myself, and coming home. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we were getting all that big money. Yeah. Oh, fifteen dollars a month. Combat pay of forty five, sixty five. I sent all that to my grandparents. Mm -hmm. You know. So you know. Did you go on an R and R? I you? did. I went to uh Tokyo. What was that experience like? Uh you know, it was supposed to be a break. To me it was more of the government trying to pu push pu funnel you through a cattle a prod, you know. I mean, they they were. Uh, it it was almost the shady side of the of the uh, industry that mm -hmm. you know you, they put you in all the bad places to me, and thinking that's uh, you know my my uh, when I got my choices to go places uh, overseas, I went to the Holy Land, mm -hmm. I went to Rome, mm -hmm. I went to uh, Genoa. Mm -hmm. uh, and places like that, but this thing with the, uh, I almost felt like we didn't leave Vietnam. We just flew somewhere else for a break in five days. I, I was still shaking, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, I yeah. didn't know, uh, I didn't know what, yeah. what to think of it. it did, I, I don't remember seeing anything in yeah. Tokyo. Yeah, it was just, yeah. How long before I got to go yeah. back? Yeah, and then I took uh, in country with uh, Frank and. Oh, okay. Uh, Lieutenant Par Parsons, mm -hmm. which that was a break. That was probably easier. No, much easier. Those guys are just, you know, we were able to breathe yeah. for a little bit. How were you treated when you got back to the States? Terrible. It was, uh, I was at Mercer uh, in the uh, fall of 68. I was a baseball player. Uh, and you would have thought that would earn you a little something, mm -hmm. uh, but disrespected by, there were only five or six of us on campus. And then uh, as God would have it, another incident came along that uh, took a lot of heat off me. Jane Fonda came to Mercer mm -hmm. and brought her Vietnam veterans against the war. Mm -hmm. 
and my guys, three or four of them, were going, and they said, you got to go. And I said, I'm not going in there. And you got to go. I said, okay, I'll go with y'all. So I go, we sit, and she prays this guy out and says, uh, this guy goes, uh, you know, we all know that the, uh, that the race wars are in, and the Marines are having race wars in Vietnam when their fights ought to be here. And then he goes, uh, and we also know that the Marines are going out 500 yards blowing pot and gazing at the stars. They're not really fighting. Yeah. Well, you just stepped on my uh -huh. golf 2-9 now. I mean, I'm, though we get to questions and answers, you know. And I was trying to make this, all right, I got 5,000 kids in this place. Yeah. So I'm thinking, good Lord, they're going to believe this. So I said, I just want to speak to that issue uh, for golf company, 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines, 3rd Platoon because I was their platoon leader. First of all, Vietnam's a very complicated war. There, there are places where there might be people that do drugs, might be Marine, but not in Golf Company 2-9. Two, two mm -hmm. If we caught you doing that, we might take you out ourselves. Mm -hmm. And you don't go 500 yards and blow pot and get the stars where we were or you wouldn't come back. Mm -hmm. Well, you would have thought he'd let me go, right? Nope. Oh. Sit back. Oh, and, and then I said, and I had two of my black Marines uh, cut their wrist because Stokely Carmichael had signed some pamphlets and they dropped it on our position at Contien, hmm. citing rights. Hmm. And uh, so I said, I saw two of my black Marines slice their wrists, and so when they get back to the States, they'll kill him themselves. And so we didn't have racial conflict in Golf 2 9. Mm -hmm. you, you don't do that when you fight for yeah, your life. But yeah. Hawkins was my black roommate in mm -hmm. my foxhole mm -hmm. for 40, about 30 yeah. days. Yeah. We took turns getting on the bottom because mm -hmm. thinking who's on the bottom might be able to say what happened to the one on top. Well, <clears throat> I said that little story and I said, uh, and I just want to speak. That's just Golf Company, 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines. I know that group. I said, hey, where's that Marine? And he stood me back up. I'm, I was looking at my guys. I go, what is this guy doing? Surely he ain't going to take me on and what I know. And so he said, uh, about that uh, dropping pamphlets on your position, said, we all know the North Vietnamese didn't have enemy aircraft. I thought, where is he coming from? I said, I never said anything about enemy aircraft, uh, although there were sightings. But uh, surely you've heard of variable ter uh, time canister rounds, artillery canister rounds. That's how you get your mail a lot of times, you know. Boy, now the crowd's starting to come on, you know, yeah. I'm not going. And then he said, uh, oh, and we're talking about Tet Offensive 1968. I'd sit back down. Where were you? He said, I said, I was on the DMZ, hmm. 68, hmm. exactly. And that produced this unbelievable groundswell. They about ran her out of the place. Good. And uh, then he invited me, he said, well, we want you to be a, part of the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. I said, I thought that's what I was. But will you sign? I'm sure I will. Go up there. Jane Fonda has that. And I sign it, put my name, put out of contact, never heard from him again. So that was partly uh, in a small campus. That gave me a lot of leverage, you yeah. know, that I wouldn't have had. But there was still uh, very, uh, they were very much... Uh, against us and 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 boxed us and you know yeah. boxed us yeah. in. and we we couldn't get out of that box if we tried you yeah. know so basically i just did what i did and ultimately uh became a university council yeah talk a little bit about what you did after the military your career well i went to undergrad at mercer and then went to law school at mercer mm -hmm. and uh then was hired as mercer's first in-house counsel uh you know, I just I thought I'd just do that as a because I had a job, and then, you know, and I mm -hmm. had been working some there. But that was a, turned out to be a pretty big gig because 1833 is a long time not to have a, an in-house legal office. Mm -hmm. And now they and now I set it up, and then I became secretary of the board of trustees and house counsel. But I was not getting any law experience. I was doing yeah. so much administrating. Yeah that uh, I just, so I quit to do what you did. Mm -hmm. I quit uh, to go to South Georgia and be a prosecutor. 
And uh, the old assistant dean of the law school, uh, DuPont Cheney, had taken Liberty County and five counties down there, and he was a senior uh, guy. So he called me up and said, uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll give you $22,000 a year in a car, you know, whip antenna and all the microphones. He said, I want you to be my lead guy. So I went down there and took the job. I said, okay, DuPont, you, you got me. I mean, I, mean, I took me to a football game, you know, a little high school game. Yeah. We had, we had, you know, a box seat, probably yeah. like Uncle Red gets. He was a athletic doctor for my parents. But, you know, I get got that, had a little whip antenna car and had a house on the golf course. And I went back to Mercer and I told Dr. Harris, who was I got another great mentor besides the colonels I had and the generals I had and that general you just interviewed a little while ago, mm -hmm. I had Dr. Rufus Carrollton Harris III, president of Mercer University, knighted mm -hmm. by the Queen of England, chairman of the Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. president of Tulane for 20 years, and got fired because he wouldn't give Huey Long an honorary doctorate. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm leaving mm -hmm. the same way I came, fired with enthusiasm. <laughs> then he came to Mercer and integrated it. And he came to Mercer and integrated it in 1962. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Harris didn't take a lot of gruff, you know, and so he hires me. So I come in to tell him I'm going to work for a, a former dean of his down in South Georgia. He said something like, the hell you are, get, uh, Amelia? I swear he talked to her. Get, get DuPont on the phone. And I'm in his office and, DuPont, what are you doing coming up here raiding my uh, council? What are you paying him? And DuPont said, 22. And he said, well, we're going to raise him to 23. Now you get somebody else. <laughs> well, that was big money for me. You know, I've yeah. been making 12. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I told DuPont, call me every year. <laughs> yeah, let's see what, if you got something. <laughs> and he said, no, Dr. Harris killed both of us. I said, That's true. But he was a wonderful mentor. Uh, you know, told me one day uh, after five years there that uh, – he called me in and said, Newton, I just have, I just can't tell you how wonderful it is. And you've done such a great job. You're on the executive boards of the national associations. You've done such a wonderful job. But I have a problem with you, son. And I said, yes, sir, what's that? Everybody loves you. I can't find one person on this campus, faculty, that does not love Newton Moore. And that's a problem, son. A man is known as much by his enemies as he is by his friends, and you don't have any. You need to get out there and make some and make the right ones. <laughs> now you can put your national politics in perspective, can't you? Yeah. Because yeah. he was doggone right. And in the meantime, uh, I also had uh, Dahl and Oates uh, in uh, head of the Quorum of Twelve of the uh, Mormon Church, and I had uh, Father Hesburgh at oh, Notre really? Dame. Mm. I had. I had an audience with him for three hours uh, because of the work I did. But I, w I did an ecumenical research center uh, for uh, from Notre Dame, mm. and uh, then I went to uh, Tech, Georgia Tech. I wanted to get into practice law. I really wanted to get into the courtroom, so I was working my way back in the, that way. And so I was hired at the Advanced Technology Development Center at Georgia Tech on Friday by Jerry Birchfield, who was the director. I reported on Monday morning to a reef on the door. He had hung himself Saturday night. Oh. So I had no job. Uh, nobody in the place knew me. Mm. And uh, so I just picked up trying cases for, uh, you know, the mm. firms that weren't a litigator. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to do. And mm. so I'd done that, still do it. Uh, I have four or five cases now that I'm Good. working. And that's a, uh, and I and I did go off to uh, Michigan uh, with with the curb with the president's blessing and completed a PhD in higher education administration. But you know, as I told uh, Michael Red, you know, as much writing as he's done, and and it's been brilliant. You know, the one thing that I took me a year to write with my dissertation, and nobody read it but me and three reviewers and it'll never be read i can't even read it anymore i don't know why i wrote it but you know it's got some really worthwhile projects to do
I imagine that was, in a way, an enjoyable experience, wasn't it? It was hard, but enjoyable. Yeah, yeah sure. It was different. It was very different. I, I, I couldn't take a test at Michigan in 1980 without being on a computer terminal. Mm -hmm. And I came back to Mercer, and we didn't even have a PC. <laughs> or we didn't have a word processor. <laughs> oh. So the conversion of Mercer to automation was the death of me. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, that was just all I could think. Talk about your um, family, your kids, well, grandchildren. And well, I came back from uh, Vietnam, and uh, I, uh, you know, all of my loves have had, had left the building, <laughs> uh, except one that I had dated, and uh, I, I believe that you know I got into that too early. Mm -hmm. uh, we we uh, had a long long term marriage, and uh, she was. Uh, she made me feel back at home. I was mm -hmm. back at home, and it it just didn't work. We did uh, have a uh, a son who's in New York at uh, the uh, on Long Island uh, in a deep freeze right now mm -hmm. with yeah. two our two little granddaughters, and then I have a son who just started practicing law about five years ago and two boys, and uh, then I was by myself for a pretty good while, and I. I swore I'd never do it again, and uh, so it happens when you're not looking. Mm -hmm. And for the last uh, 20 years, I've had the love of my life. And Joyce, she wanted to be here today, but she's taking care of her sister who mm -hmm. lives with us. So yeah. we live in Gainesville. I actually lived in East Cobb, and Dunwoody, and then came uh, back up here because. My summers on Lake Lanier were on my uncle's property. When you know, when you're, oh, when yeah. you knew, uh, uh, you, you know Richard Russell and that crew in the '50s, and they're filling up that hole over there. Yeah, you got an inside scoop on four or five lots. Yeah, yeah. So Miriam and I and the family would come spend spend summers. I've just always been attracted to Lake Lanier, and all of us, all the families, kind of around Lake Lanier. Yeah. So I decided to come. I commuted to Peachtree Street from Lake Lanier for wow. seven, eight years. And I just said, I can't do this. Oh, That's why I know what about your schedule. <laughs> I'd be right ahead of traffic, you know. But you listen to a lot of good music yes. for that hour and a half. <laughs> yeah, you do. That's exactly right. So I've been very, very happy and very pleased to be around with him for the last few years, yeah. too. It's been a joy. He always showed up for me. Yeah, you know, he well. was a doctor running from pillar to post, but I might see him at my Paris Island graduation and bam, or a football game. Yeah. You'll, yeah. you'll always remember the memories with him, I'm oh, sure. Oh, I, I, listen, I always tell him, yes, sir, that's a spice of life. And you too, guys too, I want to welcome you home. Well, Doesn't get said enough. Were you in the service? No, sir, Navy wife. Navy wife. Yes, sir. I, well, yeah, you were in the service, <laughs> right? <laughs> Okay. I want to ask anybody here if they have any questions or anything to add. Or I want you to tell one story uh -huh. me uh -huh. about Louie and the truck when you were in Vietnam. Louie. Yeah, sure. Uh, Luigi Pierre Totaro, uh, what a wonderful kid, uh, came to me on uh, Contien from New York and uh, just scared out of his wits. And, you know, to, to settle his nerves or mine, one, he made pizzas, you know, that's what his family did, and he would, he would show me how he'd do it. Of course, yeah. we're doing it with mud pies up there on the <laughs> hill. And he just had a great personality, and, and I loved Louis like nothing else. So um, he, um, he's the one who killed the lizard, too. But okay. when we're on the bridge where the six by is running, and it's... A dead marine. See, I couldn't get to it. We couldn't get to it every time. That was their mark. If we tried to get to it, they mm -hmm. bam right here. As a matter of fact, with Lieutenant Cobb, who's still a great friend of mine from Virginia, took one right here, right here, and right here, and fell right down at the hill right below me. And he said, when we met not too long ago, he said, "You remember what you said to me?" And I said. Gosh, no. And he said, you said, you're the slowest lieutenant in Vietnam to let him get you three times before you get down. <laughs> in three different places. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, all, but this truck is running, still running over 24 hours, and we couldn't get to it. And all of a sudden, I hear it 
coming toward me. And I thought, one of those kids has come alive and they're driving that truck. And when it got out of the killing zone, it came right by me. I jumped on the running board. It was Louie driving the truck and tears were coming down his eyes. And I said, Louie, stop the truck. And he said, I don't know how to drive. New York kids don't drive. No, that's right. <laughs> so I reached in and turned it off. I went down, sat down there on a sea ration box and rode, a, rode him up for the Medal of Honor. Hmm. You know, and I never done that with any other Marine. Yeah. And I rode him up. I gave it to the captain when we came. Our captain had been told he wouldn't, we wouldn't be sent out again because we just got beat up. Mm -hmm. But they did. They sent us out, and he was gone. So we finally got off that. God's second place, there was our captain, all fresh from R&R, &R, and mm -hmm. you know how bad he was hurting. I can see it in your face. Mm -hmm. And I went over to him. Mm. I said, Skip, you're going to have to let this go. Now, remember, he wasn't in the battle. Yeah. I knew what he was feeling. Yeah. He gave me his canteen, and I said, you got to let it go. It wasn't your fault. We'd have done a lot better with you, but, you know, you got to let it go. Mm. And uh, I gave him the deal for Louie. Well, Louie didn't get the Medal of Honor because, you know, he's PFC and a lot of that stuff. You know, I got four letters of accommodation, but, you know, it's like when they started changing those kind of rules, I just sort of said, I'm not going to play this game anymore. It's, yeah. you know, you know what you know in here. Yeah. If, yeah. That's, if that's not good, you got a problem. That's right. And that's all right with me, and I can tell it is with you and you yeah. and with him. Yeah. It's all right here, you're good. You're right. So, uh, Louis was had finally bought his house in Vegas. He's a big gambler. He weighed about four hundred pounds by now. You know, eating the pot. And uh, he's going to Vegas and has an aneurysm and it dies mm. on the road. So I go eulogize him, mm. both in uh, Las Vegas and in uh, New York. Mm. And uh, you know, he is an extra wide box. You know, so yeah. <laughs> I told those Marines, I said, that ain't no ordinary Marine you're talking right there. So you be sure and. Uh, take care of him good and uh they did so and we we've, we've been putting our guys away here pretty well pretty yeah long, yeah you know? you're right i've eulogized three of them now uh, squeaky my indian uh, uh williams williamson uh, i put him down in oklahoma city now squeaky uh wasn't squeaky when he was my one of my best point men we got in a firefight and his voice changed hmm. and he he went from a Baritone to a soprano <laughs> in, about, in about five rounds. <laughs> I says, and, it, and it never changed back. So I nicknamed him Squeaky. Yeah. <laughs> you know. What can you do? Yeah. Sometimes well, and that's why it's so important that you're doing this today, because you're right. Our group is fading yeah, away a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we're going. So. That's right. It's, uh, it, it, it's. You know, it's and every I learned that everybody has a different perspective. When we were reading this reading this book, uh, I was sent me a blue line to mark on, and they had put that Bob Hagen was, and it's been in the book. It's it's in the it's in Savannah magazine that he was a coward. I said, don't say that. Why? Because he froze on the on the road that day. And I see him freeze. He was trying to figure out what to do before he did just what everybody else was doing, which is walking right into that killing zone. Yeah. But that's that boy's view. My view is totally different. So yeah. you learn in a war like that, maybe you might, might know what's going on there and over here. But when you're in a battle, you don't know what's going on way over yeah, there. That's right. It just doesn't work that way, does it? No, it doesn't. So anyhow. I'm is, glad you're doing this. Is there anything else you'd like to say or any message or anything that you didn't say that you want to say before we finish? Uh, no, I, I really think that, I'd, that I've said uh, all I think I need to say. And uh, besides the fact that we're all fortunate to be here, mm -hmm. I, I hope we learn something. Mm -hmm. yep. And I'm afraid that everywhere I look, mm -hmm. We, we seem to be learning less. You know, it's all about uh, who is anointed and uh, how can people be so blind. Mm -hmm. You know, war accomplishes very little. The last of the great ones, I don't know that we'll ever see one like that again. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know that we'll ever see the great generation and, 
it's different now. Yeah. And uh, it was different here. Yeah. But uh, I hope that our politicians will learn to look out for our country. That's and uh, if they don't, I'm afraid they're going to take it. And, and, and I have a really big problem with how it's portrayed in the media. Yeah. Well, I, that... I really do. It's, uh, it, it, it started for me on Conti Inn when the Chicago Tribune was dropped on our position. 67, and the headline in the Chicago Tribune said, Conti and to fall unless monsoons come. Hmm. And I thought, what kind of freedom of press are we dealing with? Yeah, yeah. They ain't no Chicago Tribune writer up here, because no. I know he, if no. he's up here, he's dead. Yeah. To write that uh, under the First Amendment just blew me away. And I, from that point, point on, I've been just who I am about that kind of stuff. Well, that's a, that's a good message. I just don't go do you, Again, does anybody have any questions or anything? Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank you for doing this. Yes. In fact, we all want to thank you for doing it. I mean, you've really got a great life story. I mean, you grew up without much materially, and you worked your way through a tough war, went to law school, and a successful lawyer, and a successful family man and what you did in Vietnam you tried to low key it but I think any of us that know anything about Vietnam recognize the names of the places you were fighting and that, that was some of the roughest fighting of the war. And your men obviously loved you and was it Mercer or whoever said that he, everybody likes you and that's a problem. I mean that's that's something to be proud of really. Yeah. Well. It, it is and uh, I want to thank you for being here today and thank well, you thank for your you. service. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it.